have your Bibles, please turn with me to John chapter 15. We are talking today of um, obedience, love, fruitfulness. And what I'm going to do is just do a quick recap of the first eight verses of chapter 15 because as you've seen in the bulletin we put just generically chapter 15 because all of this ties in together and it's very hard to separate the two and we'll see how the first verses, uh, first eight just flow in into the next. So I want us in chapter 15 to look at the first verse uh, because this was the verse that is a the seventh of the I am sayings. John 15 verse 1, Jesus says, I am not just the vine, but I am the true vine. And he, we looked at that last time contrasting specifically from Isaiah to chapter 5 verses 1 to 7 that in the thought pattern of the people at that time is that they they understood as God being the gardener who had planted this vineyard and now he was looking for fruit and he did not find the fruit and uh, the consequences of that. And as we know, the nation of Israel uh, messed up on numerous occasions until the time when they actually uprooted it and uh, pushed the walls down and, and uh, destroyed the land there, pushed the people out of the land, and they uh, remembered that. And so when Jesus comes along and says, I am the true vine, these are some of the memories that would come back to them about their own history of what Isaiah had prophesied and a number of the other prophets that had talked about. And so it wasn't a very good, a very positive analogy, I should say. The positiveness of it had kind of dwindled away and it, was, it turned into an analogy which had negative remembrances. And when Jesus comes along and says, I am the true vine, and this is at the very end of his life, his disciples were would be thinking, well, finally, there's something positive that's coming out of it because our own history, the negative uh, was there and, and left us, uh, pardon the pun, but a sour taste in our mouth from the sour grapes that were there from the Old Testament. And uh, it goes on to say in verse, uh, second part of verse 1, is that my father is the vine dresser. Now, this analogy here, he's, he's go taking now a different direction because in the Old Testament, God is the one who planted it. But now he's taking it a step further to show how to be successful as a um, fruit-bearing people. And in the Old Testament, God was the, the owner who planted this. But in this case, God is actually the gardener who will clip and he will prune, and he is the one looking for the fruit that is there. In verse 2, not every branch, or not every, um, every branch not fruit bearing in me, he, that is God, takes it away. So God cuts away this unproductivity, the second part of verse 2, but every one bearing fruit, he prunes it so that it may bear even more. And uh, so we, we get the clear picture here that it is the Father as the uh, vine dresser who is actually looking for fruit. And this is going to, I'm going to be picking up this theme as we get into our text for today. Uh, also about the fact that we are not doing things for ourselves. We do not grow fruit for ourselves. The Father, the Father is the one who is looking for the fruit. He was looking for it in the Old Testament and he's looking for it in the New Testament through you and me. And this is, uh, comes to a climax here in, uh, of, in, chapter, in verse 4 of chapter 15 where he says, Abide in me and I in you. It's a command. It's an imperative. As the branch is not able to bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine, so neither you unless you abide in me. And we looked at Deuteronomy 28. These are the blessings and the curses. We liked all the blessings. We don't like the curses so much. But the difference between blessings and curses are absolutely and totally dependent upon the recipient of either one. You get the blessings, great. You've been walking in the path. You get the curses, your problem. You deserve them. And that was the predominant uh, flavor in the Old Testament is that when prophets would get up and they'd speak the declarations of God, they wouldn't say anything new. Basically, prophets very seldom back then or today very seldom say anything new. They just simply point back to the Word and say, if you've been abiding in the vine, you will get the blessings. 
But if you are not abiding in the vine, and unfortunately most Old Testament prophets had to talk about the negative stuff, they said you are not abiding in the vine, you're not producing the fruit, and judgment day is coming. But it, there we have it, and that's the um, picked up, I believe I've put it there in Galatians 3, verses 24, 25, talking about the, the difference between the Old and the New Testament. The Old Testament was done by letter of the law. Do this, do this, do this, don't do this, don't do that, don't do that. New Testament, we live by the Spirit. Christ in you, the hope of glory. We are filled with the Spirit. The Spirit teaches us all things. So uh, rather than be book bound and, and trying to follow things, the letter of the law, just, just live life. Just live life normally. Enjoy God. Live in His presence. And stay t attached in the vine. And by simply doing that, we will bear fruit. Verse 5, apart from me, you can do absolutely nothing. Talked about that the last time. If there's a water pipe and, and they're joined by a bunch of uh, pieces, and if these pieces aren't aligned, we're not going to be able to carry the water. We have to align the pipes, so to say. We have to align ourselves with the flow of God, what's coming, in order to receive the blessings of God, but then also to be able to pass the blessings of, on, of God on. And in verse 7, um, if, if, if you abide in me and my words abide in you, you shall ask whatever you wish and it will come to pass. It will happen. It will happen. Um, it's like that vending machine. If the vending machine is plugged in and the vending machine is working and if the vending machine is full, then it will work. Only then it will work. Everything has to line up and then we'll get the product that we want and so it is that simple. We know it in the natural, but we need to, to know that in the spiritual as well. Then we summarized and included last time in verse 8, uh, it's all for the Father's glory. This is in this my Father is glorified that you should bear much fruit and you shall be my disciples. Because oftentimes the question comes up, how do we know if someone is a disciple of God, of Jesus Christ? How? How? How can we tell? Here, this chapter has the answer for that. I'm going to read now. We're going on to the next section. Just before I pray, I'm going to read the, um, some, some words, some key words here in this next section called Obedience and Love. If we have the next slide, I've, I've put them on for you. I'm going to read a few verses here in our text. And I want you to pay attention to these particular words that come up. The word love comes up nine times. The word command comes up five times. The word father is five times. Abide or remain, which is the same word, comes four times. Friends three times and fruit twice. In a short passage of scripture, um, as I took my highlighter and just highlighted some of these to see how many times this would come and what's the predominant thought, it was amazing how this all um, just oozes out of John when he writes this. And, and it comes up in particular with his letters that he writes the love of God. And so here's the love is the pre predominant thought, but tied in with that. We cannot understand the love of God. We cannot experience the love of God unless we experience some of these other things. So now I will read it in the uh, Berean uh, literal translation. And you can follow along in your, in your Bibles. In chapter uh, 15, verse 9. As the Father has loved me, I also have loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will remain in my love. Just as I have kept my Father's commandments and remain in his love. These things I have spoken to you that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be full. Twelve, this is my commandment that you love one another as I loved you. Greater love has no one than this, than one should lay down his life for his friends. You are my friends if you do what I command you. No longer do I call you servants, for servants... For the servant does not know what his master is doing. But I have called you friends because all the things I heard from my father I have made known to you. 16. You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you that you should go and you should bear fruit. And your fruit should remain. So that whatever you ask, you might ask the father in my name, he may give you. 
These things I command you that you love one another. Father, we thank you for your love. We thank you for your word. Thank you for your heart. Thank you for everything, O Lord Jesus, that you have come and not only taught us, you displayed it to us. So I pray now these generations have come and gone, centuries have come and gone, millennium have come and gone. We're here reading your word tonight. Make it real to us today as it was the night you spoke this, dear Jesus. Give us ears to hear what you're saying. Open our hearts. Pray against any distractions, any disturbances. Lord, give us clarity of thought, clarity of mind, both to deliver and to receive. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. The text for tonight goes on, and it goes on starting in verse 18. Uh, It continues, and it says there, If the world hates you, remember that it hated me first. The world would not would love you as one of its own if it belonged to it but you are no longer part of the world I chose you to come out of the world so it hates you in the next few verses here the words world and hate come up these amount of times hate seven times world six times and it is this this paragraph these verses 18 to 25 are in absolute sharp contrast to the verses that sit just before the word hate does not come there it, it, it's uh, it, it's the, the, the word love is in the first part and hate is in the second part. And, and putting these two side by side, we get the, the contrast and we get the greatness of God, uh, of what he has available for us and why Jesus died uh, for us and what's available to us through all of that. So let's pick them apart one by one very quickly. We'll go through this. First of all, um, love. While we know John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. This fits in perfectly in the context of all of John and that's why he put it in there and the other gospel writers didn't have it. Not that Jesus it wasn't important to the others. It's just that John made it very clear in the end of his book puts down the thesis of his book, the statement of why he wrote John in 20, verses 30 and 31. These things are written that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, and that by believing in him, you would have life and have it life abundant or eternal or everlasting or fullness of life. All of this is available uh, here only if we understand love. We don't understand love, we don't get it. We miss it. It goes by us. And uh, so John 3.16 stands in many ways, and we've used it many times. I have, you have, we've all done, when we explain to people the love of God, the expanse of God's love, the vastness of God's love, that he gave his only begotten son. He didn't spare the best what he had. And uh, the, uh, the, the foreshadow of this, of course, is Abraham, when he went up the mountain to offer up his son Isaac. And, and after the years, years of waiting on this promise, the... Um, he finally gets the gift. And God says, I want you to give up the gift. He does. Or at least he's willing to. And it's on that very same mountain, Mount Moriah, that, that uh, centuries later, Jesus gave up his life for you and for me. Except for this time, there's no intervention by any ram on the side. The nails were pierced into his hands, And he hung on the cross for you and for me. And this is the ultimate definition of love. So where does that fit in the context? Well, if we take a look at uh, chapter 15 and verse 13, right in the middle here, it says, There is no greater love than to lay down one's life for one's friend. You know, we, we can sacrifice for friends. It's, but this is the ultimate sacrifice. And um, Jesus was saying this just a few hours before he was going to demonstrate it. He knew exactly what he's going towards. He knew the steps. He probably even knew the hours, if not the minutes, when this would be fulfilled. 
And who is he talking to? He's talking to his 11 friends. He's talking to his 11 disciples, the apostles, the called out ones. One has already left. One no longer abided with him, but departed. And he says to them, to test your ultimate love is right here. Now, history um, is a bit scant. Uh, there is no concrete evidence of what happened to all the disciples. Um, it does tell us for a few of them, and the, and the few that we know died a martyr's death, except for John, uh, that it, it appears that he lived out his life to, to the full before the Lord took him home. But I wonder if in the life of the disciples, whether it was uh, dying by the sword or hanging on a cross, being beaten to death, whatever, these words would have come back to them. Because you have to remember of all the time that they were with Jesus, this was one of the most crucial times. I mean, they were sitting at the edge of their seats. Jesus had just finished telling them, one of you is going to betray me. And remember when we studied that, Judas was so slick and so sly that in the three and a half years, even his closest disciples didn't know who the betrayer was. And so this was an intense night. And they would have remembered this, and we can see this as the Spirit brought it back to John, all the things that were said that night. So this would have lingered on in their minds. And this is the apostolic teaching that Acts 2.42 talks about, things like this and many more that we don't, probably don't have as well. But love, love, greater love has no one than he laid down his life for his friend. Well, let's go on to the word command. In chapter 15, verse 10, we have to go back to this here. It says, when you obey my commandments, you remain in my love. And so here what we find out in, in verse 10 is that, is that love cannot be understood unless it's tied in with commands and obedience to the commandments. Just as I obey my Father's commandments and remain in His love. We talked about that last Sunday, that the word remain or abide was the key word uh, highlighted in verse 4. Abide in me. I mean, if <laughs> what... What kind of branch, when you think about the analogy, you're kind of saying, Jesus, maybe a different analogy would have made a bit more sense. But Jesus knew exactly what he's talking about. Because when a branch is with a vine, it has to abide. It has to abide. There's nothing it can do. There is nothing it can do but abide and to stay with it. The twig branch has no inherent power in itself to do anything else but to be a conduit from the nutrients, from the roots, up to the trunk, through the vine, into the, um, out to the fruit. So then we ask, why the imperative? Why the imperative abide? <laughs> because it's just that. It's an analogy. He's talking about you and he's talking about me. It's not that we come to the Lord at an altar call or sometime or home or wherever it is where we confess Jesus as personal Lord and Savior, believe in our heart, confess with our mouth, and then sit back and do nothing. No. It's abide. It's an imperative. Stay, remain in Christ. And that, dear friends, takes work. That takes work. Lots of work. It comes with a command. It's to be kept. These commandments are to be kept. Think back to uh, Exodus uh, chapter 20. We know it. It's the uh, Ten Commandments. And these are the commandments, the Decalogue. This is what you're to do. Do this, do this, don't do this, don't do that, do this, don't do that. And if people did it, there had to be obedience to it, they would receive the blessings of God. And um, as the rich young ruler th came and he thought that as well. And he actually did get the blessing of God. He did, he did all this stuff. He says, it's wonderful stuff. And he did it. And uh, in part, in part, um, part of the evidence that was there was the blessings that he was in he, and he received. 
But yet there was an emptiness on the inside because it was just a letter of the law. And the full blessings of God go beyond that. And this guy had the emptiness. He did the letter of the law and it didn't fulfill him. And so he asked, what else do I need to do? And he says, okay, we'll give up your blessings. Because we don't live for blessings. At least not for blessings to bless ourselves. We get blessed to bless other people. And that's what Jesus was telling him. Abide in me. The, the fruit, the, 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 the branch, the twig, does not bear fruit for its benefit. Doesn't do that. Verse 12, chapter 15, verse 12. Look what it says here. This is my commandment. Love each other in the same way I have loved you. We talk of the great commission from Matthew 28. Go ye therefore into all the world. Well, there's the great commission, but there's also the great commandment. And what is the great commandment? Thou shalt love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And we can find this in Matthew 22 and verse 36. It's there, and it comes from the Old Testament. And the religious leaders came up to Jesus and asked him, what is the greatest commandment? And he says exactly that. And notice what it starts with. It starts with love. Love the Lord your God. Love him with all your heart. And so that goes beyond the letter of the law. And those that lived in the Old Testament and understood the law of the Spirit at that time, they lived in the love of God and walked in the fullness of it. Verse 17 summarizes the commandment part. This is my commandment, love one another. We are living as believers in this country as a minority, as an incredible small minority. And we are worshiping on a small hill, probably the smallest hill that I've seen, but the biggest one in the city, so they tell us, from 100 years ago. Um, what, is, what is the reputation of believers, of us as believers, in this city, in this country? We are the minority. We are a few. How will the, will the world know that we belong to the Father. Right here. Right here. To love one another. The next one after that, and I don't want to run off a rabbit trail here, but just to put it in comparison, I believe the next one next down next to love, love is the ultimate, the highest, and the price of that is to lay down one's life for somebody else. But the next one down to that is unity. Unity. Um, not uniformity, but unity in the spirit. Thanks, Keith, for that song, that second song. I think it was right out of the book of John. Yeah, beautiful. I, I love it when we sing scripture. Thank you. It's excellent. Walking hand in hand, walking in the faith, walking in, in truth, walking in love, walking in the grace of God, walking in the commandments of God to be unified is difficult. It's a very difficult thing uh, to, to do that. Um, another topic for another time step up for that is to walk in love and uh, 1 Corinthians 13 talks about love love forgets it overseas it, it, it helps, it perseveres does that and that's a challenge for believers but the world will know that and they'll be drawn to the love of God if they can see the love of us demonstrated in our speech in our actions. It's a high challenge. It's a high challenge. But it's a commandment of God. Let's go on. Fifth to the third word. Father. For this, I want to turn back. Just turn back a few pages, please, to chapter 5. Chapter 5 and verse 18. And it was here the, um, the Jewish religious leaders harassing Jesus for breaking the Sabbath rules. And... Um, Jesus in verse 17 says, Well, my father is always doing work, and so am I. 
Verse 18, so the Jewish leaders tried all the harder to find a way to kill him. For he not only broke the Sabbath, he called God his father and thereby making himself equal with God. In this passage that we are reading, 15, he talks about the father many times. And he's always drawing back to the father. Now, back in chapter um, uh, 5, they're still trying to understand his deity. Some of them get it and some of them don't. Okay? And, uh, and so he, he lets out its, its uh, re revelation uh, revealed bit by bit. We call that progressive revelation. Little by little he reveals who he is and how he's related to, to God. Okay? And the relationship used there, the analogy of father and son. And um, so pointing out here, by the time we get to the room, the upper room, with his disciples, he's got a few hours left, um, he's using the word father very, very freely and very frequently because he's assuming by now that they should be getting it. In fact, when we go on to chapter 17, it's absolutely crystal clear in the prayer that he, he makes uh, there with them. Uh, this, we can see the progressive revelation in chapter 14 now. If we go on to chapter 14 in verses 1, 2, and 3, don't let your hearts be troubled. Trust in God. Trust also in me. There is more than enough room in my Father's house or my Father's mansions. If this were not so, I would have told you. And so he's saying, I'm going to my Father's house to prepare a place for you, meaning you're going to be with me with my Father living there. Oh, what a beautiful invitation. Because within a few hours of Jesus having said this in chapter 15, they w felt abandoned. Even Jesus himself. Remember when he starts uh, crying out that psalm, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And if Jesus felt forsaken, how much more the disciples? And so he's giving them these words of comfort just a few days before. And he says, I am going to prepare a place for you in my Father's house so that you can join me there. Well, let's go on with the word abide. And as we said last week, this is on John 15, verse 4. He, he, is the, he gives the imperative, abide in me. Now, this time I want to take, take a look in our passage. We want to take a look at verse 9. He says very clear in chapter 15, verse 9, he says, um, abide or other translations say, remain in my love. And, and what we're seeing is earlier that chart that you've seen on here with all of those words that come up uh, multiple times, love, command, father, abide, uh, friends, and fruit, all of this stuff. What you will see is that they all fit together. It's like a network. It's a net that holds it together. And in order to understand the one, you got to understand the other. And you start understanding a bit more of this one. And you go, oh, now we understand that better. And then you're on to the third word. And you begin to study that word. And now all of a sudden the other two begin to make more sense. And then you go on to the fourth one. And it sheds light until you get a bigger and bigger picture of the love of God. And how we can experience the love of God. But it comes with conditions. It comes with a command and, a, and, and it comes with obedience to the command. And, and this one here in this particular case says abide. We have to abide. It's a, it, the word actually is, um, the, the concept is like remaining or staying in him, okay? Not just passively sitting there wasting time and twiddling our thumbs, but it's an act of waiting on God, staying in his presence. And this comes up now also in verse 10. Verse 10, uh, twice it comes up here. Uh, when you obey my commandments, you remain in my love just as I obey my Father's commandments and remain in His love. And that's why Jesus was such a man of, of focus and, and intensity, yet at the same time of love and passion for the lost, because He knew the love of the Father. Why? Because He obeyed the Father. And how could He obey the Father? Because He's listening to the Father. And all of these things have to fall into place. And he says, I've given you this an example for you to follow. So you can do exactly the same way. So abide in me as I abide in the Father. And these things will come uh, to you. Well, let's go on to the next one, the word friends. Interesting here. <laughs> Very interesting verse. 
verse 14. I'm going to read it from the, um, from the brain again. Verse 14. You are my friends if you do what I command you. Okay, think back to your childhood days and the playground. <laughs> and you've got friends and you're jostling for, for friends. You know how kids are, right? There's a whole group of them and either you're friends with this group or not this group. And it's back and forth. Well, if you're friends with so-and-so, you're not going to be my friend. And then you can imagine the uh, thought of one kid saying to another kid, Okay, you want to be my friend? Yeah, okay, good. Well, you can be my friend under one condition that you do everything exactly what I tell you to do. Now, if it's the first time you ever heard it, right, the little kid who's small will say, okay, until he, he gets told to go up in the top of the swings and jump off. <laughs> oh, yeah, and it doesn't happen again. And every time after that, someone says unconditionally, you're going to do whatever I tell you to do? You're like, no, no, it doesn't happen. Um, and, and this, is, this is human, this is life, this is normal. We, we learn after a while to uh, trust with reservation. And Jesus knows that. That our friendship is highly, highly conditional on things. So, in part, he plays with it. Oh, you want to be my friend? Here's a condition. He sets out the condition. You are my friends if you do what I command. And this time, it's non-negotiable. And by this time, I believe also his disciples who were sitting with him in that room understood that they can trust him. You know, we, we often say that statement, and uh, you, you see it, the signs in, in, in business or in, in stores. In God we trust, all others pay cash. We know what happens when people say, oh, trust me. Jesus says, trust me. And they had to learn that. And guess what? 2,000 years later, we have to learn that. We have to learn afresh the trust of Jesus. And, when he's, and he tells us, though, the nice thing with him is that he doesn't tell us any surprises. He already told them the conditions of love told him the conditions of unity and all of these things, and to do what he asked us to do. Uh, then also with this uh, issue of friends, take a look at the very next verse. It says, No longer do I call you servants, for the servant does not know what his master is doing. But I have called you friends, because of all the things I heard from my father, I have made known to you. Let's bring back memories before the law. Abraham. God's going to go down and he's going to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah because of the wickedness that has come up there. And uh, he's on his way to destroy it. And he walks by Abraham's tent. Good visit. And then sort of like we, we get this, you know, if, if Hollywood could make a good presentation, it's like, almost like a double take. Just, just a minute, just a minute. A Abraham's my friend. I can't do something without talking with my friend. And so it goes back, and we know the story. Abraham starts negotiating. <laughs> you don't negotiate with God. But when you're friends with God, you negotiate. Why? Because God understands our frailty. And so Gideon had his times of doubt as well. And God oversaw that and says, okay, I'll help you out. You got weaknesses, I'll, I'll work with you. Uh, Abraham here was fighting for his relatives. Um, Jesus turns to his 11 and he calls them friends. Not just servants, not just, not just students. He was a rabbi. He was not a rabbi going through and they were getting disciples. That's what all the rabbis did back then. And so they would have been known. They're thinking of themselves as students and, and uh, followers of Jesus in that traditional classical sense of this is a rabbi with new teaching. This wasn't common. This was not common to have a rabbi turn to his students and call them friends. No, they want to keep the distance. Look at the life of all the religious leaders. Always distance. Keeping it one up over them. Making sure their nose is always tilted a little bit higher 
that they look down nicely on it to the others. And Jesus says, no, 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 you're friends. We, we, we look eye to eye. We talk as friends. And he does that to his 11. And this is the apostolic teaching that was passed on in Acts 2.42. This kind of a teaching, that this gets passed on in the church. That we stand, all of us, on equal plane before the Father. We all in this room have equal access to the Father. And he calls us friends. If we abide in him, if we obey his commands, if we love him and walk in his love and all of these things that come across. Um, I'll come to the fruit at the end. Let's go on to the, so far it's all been negative things. Let's go on, or positive things. Let's go to the negative one, the world's hate. And let's look at that for the next few verses there. Just want to summarize those, that grouping of verses 18 to 25 with this here. In, in, in verse 18 here, um, it says, if, if the world hates you, starts off conditionally, if, well, it does, uh, remember that it hated me first. And Paul says that to Timothy, right? You're going to face persecution. It's going to come. It's going to happen. Jesus said that to his disciples there and in other places already before. A persecution will come. Why? Why does it come? Well, because it hates, the world hates Jesus. Well, why does the world hate Jesus. Well, it hates God. It hates a creator. And so the whole movement which we're still uh, working against in many ways is Darwinism. And, and what was at the root of that whole theory, which, by the way, Darwin himself rejected at the end of his life. But what was the motivating force? Well, if you believe in creation, you have to believe in God. This was a movement against the church at that time or the doctrines of the, of the Bible. And so well, let's come up with an alternative theory of about our beginnings. And if we come up with an ulterior beginning which doesn't need God, we don't have to obey God. It all comes back to the same thing here. And Jesus says here, uh, don't worry if the world hates you. He says, basically, relax. It hated me first. It hated me first. And they watched that. They seen that, the constant fight he had. And in verse 23 here, this goes on. In verse 23, it says, anyone who hates me also hates my father. And that was the issue because the religious leaders and others thought that they loved God, but they could hate Jesus. It doesn't work that way. You have to accept the message of Jesus. There's only one way to the father, and that is through Jesus. In verse uh, 19, uh, hate is the opposite of, of love. Look at the first part of verse uh, 19. It says here, um, the world would love you as one of its own if you belonged to it. But we are called out of the world. The second part, but you are no longer part of the world. I chose you to come out of the world so that it hates you. Just as an as a quick aside here, um, we have to be very careful. Now, I remember uh, going to, um, when I was in seminary, reading some books, took a course on, on church growth. It was so ironic. I, it, was, it was absolutely amazing. The course was called Church Growth, and all the textbooks that we used, several textbooks, all of them talked about <laughs> the dysfunctional church and why the church wasn't growing. <laughs> so why don't we have textbooks study churches that are growing, and let's use those textbooks. Amazing course. Anyways, um, reading this stuff, and there was, I, I remember I had just come back from Africa where the church was growing and exploding and things were going. We couldn't keep up with, in our Bible schools, in our extended Bible schools, producing enough church leaders, theologically trained people to run the churches or even home groups, cell groups, or, or even, uh, and uh, right on preaching points. We, we couldn't keep up with the church growth. It was wonderful. And then you get back into a Canadian context and all that they're doing is lamenting about the position that the church no longer has which it once had in the world where the church had an influence. The Bible doesn't ever call us to that. It never does. If we try to make friends with the world, we'll be at odds with God. 
And so we as a church, we don't go out of our way and compromise our rules. We don't compromise our beliefs and our standards in order to be accepted by the world. We never do that. We only want to be accepted by one. And if God accepts us, that's all we need. That is all we need. We don't compromise anything else. You see, the whole word in the New Testament, Ecclesia, is called out ones. Why, why would you want to mix when you've been called out? Jesus sent his son into the world to save you and me, to forgive us our sins. And so he pulls us out of the evil world. Not out physically, but out. We have a new life. We're in a new kingdom, a new passport, a new identity, a new fatherhood, new family. Everything is new. Why? Why? Would you want to mix with the world? Why? We don't, thank God. Verse 25, chapter 15, verse 25. This fulfills what was written in their scriptures. They hated me without cause. They hated me without cause. Well, this goes back, it's, uh, it's uh, from Psalm 69, a psalm of affliction. It's prophetic of the Messiah. When I looked up this word, uh, they hated me without cause. Look up the word cause. Very interesting what, what the word cause says. It means uh, a free gift without payment, freely. Oh, thanks for your afflictions. <laughs> without price. Thank you. Very interesting choice of words. They hated Jesus freely, without a gift. Jesus didn't pay them to hate him. They did it free willingly on their own. They did it without payment. When I was looking at these, when I was comparing the first few verses and the last few verses here in this passage, we got in John, and I read this, and it goes back to Psalm 69, I thought of Genesis because in Genesis is the beginning of all things, correct? That's what the word is, means, and that's what it is. Um, from that come all the doctrines. Any doctrine you want to study in Scripture, go back to Genesis. Well, you take all of these words and you'll find them there in Genesis 2 and Genesis 3. Um, well, first of all, look at the, the positive stuff, the, the abiding in the command. So God makes man and puts him in the garden, puts Adam and Eve in there, and he gives them what? He gives them a commandment to work. And then he gives them a commandment about a certain tree. And not just the tree, but its fruit. Do not eat from that fruit. And John 15 is all about fruit. Abiding in the vine. And so there they were, Adam and Eve. They had the words of God. They were asked to obey the commandments of the Father in the garden and just simply obey it. And if they did, they would receive the blessings of God, fullness of life, absolute fullness of life. It was there in the garden. Everything was given to them. Father's love lavished on them day by day. But what happened? They disobeyed. They disobeyed the explicit commandment. And what happens? They were banished. They could not abide in the nice place anymore. They went out. And it's like they went out into the world, into this barrenness. Now rather than having fullness of life, they're battling with death. Their spirits are already dead. They're in hostility towards God. And how do we know that? It's manifested in the next generation with Cain and Abel. And it's resident in, in, in Cain. It's there. And so the one Abel brings his sacrifice and it's acceptable. And the other one is not. It says actually his face was downcast. His face was downcast when God said uh, after the offering, what's wrong with you? Again, you can see the father's love, the father coming to him, 
Yes, they've been kicked out of the garden. Yes, they disobeyed. But the Father's love still goes out. And it goes beyond the holy huddle. This is the beauty of the church. Yes, we're here. Yes, we're called out. But we are called out from the world in order to be built up so that as we live in the world, we can display the love of the Father because the love of the Father back in the garden, right after the garden, went out to talk to Cain and Abel. And so we can only presume that the daily conversations went on as well with both Cain and Abel. And Abel would have been one who listened, but Cain didn't listen. And God has a talk with him and says, be careful, sin is crouching at your door. It seeks to master you, but you must master it. Right after that, he gets really mad because God was correcting him and he goes and he kills his brother. And so there we, there we are. We, we see the two. This passage in John 15, abide in me and you will bear fruit. But if you don't abide, if you depart, you will not bear fruit. And then the fullness of judgment's coming there. So we can summarize it by saying there's obedience, we obey the command, and there's the disobedience. And the choice is up to us. The choice was there in the garden. The choice was there in the next generation with Cain and Abel. And the choice was there with Jesus sitting at first with the 12 disciples. And at that time, 11 of them obeyed, one disobeyed. And he walked away. And now 2,000 years later, we're here. And we get the same choice to ask, to obey or to disobey. Do we want the love of God? Because love with a God, with God is hate with the world. Love the world and you hate God. It is that way. That's our, that's our hearts set that way. Friendship with God is enmity with the world. That is disfavor. Enmity with God is friendship with the world. And this will manifest itself in either fruitfulness or in a barren desert in the wilderness. And as that first family found out, they were banished to the wilderness, to the desert. And so we come back to abide or depart. The challenge is just before we go into, I'm going to ask uh, uh, Pastor Martin and Pastor Emmanuel to come and prepare the... Communion for us. So the challenge tonight is fruit. What is the fruit from last week? What are we, we talked about fruit. Abide in me. Why? So that you bear much fruit. And this, this session today also focusing on the fruit as well. To have fruit. Well, I want to challenge us with three things. Number one, fruit is first of all for God, not for us. And we find that in chapter 15 and verse 8. It's, it's for the Father's glory. For His glory that we bear much fruit. And secondly, to bear fruit is for others. It's for other people to come and to take the fruit. As we abide in the vine, we will be a blessing to other people. There are people in the world who are far from God. They are desperate and they are hungry and they want some of the fruits of God's blessing. And once they taste it through your life and through my life, we will bring them closer to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. And then thirdly, yes, it does benefit ourselves because we get to remain in the vine. Because if we don't, we'll be cut off. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for your word. Thank you for your heart. Thank you for your love. We thank you, dear Jesus, for that which you did for us. As you sat there and talked with your disciples, and today we can hear that as well. Lord, let it resonate in our hearts. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you.